You're listening to Wolf Spirit Radio. Well, thank you for joining us today. Hello, everyone. This is Jessica Ariel Morocco coming to you live from around the Boston area, Massachusetts. So actually, a little bit more north. <laughs> Should I say Newburyport? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'll say. Um, so it's a cold, wintry day here, and uh, you know JP's here with me from Scotland, and we are. I'll tell you what this this has been a very, very interesting week. Um, we're going to be addressing the transmissions from Andromeda, the Andronicus transmissions, and uh, for a while, I think it was last week, the week before, we didn't hear from Andronicus. But um, Midas, his uh, alternate or his twin or whatever he is, uh, seemed to come up, and uh, that became um, very, very uh, revealing in the information. And now um, I actually heard from Borkum. So I have about four pages worth of conversation between Borkum and I, and I think you'll find this very interesting. But I also have um, something here from uh, Midas, as well as new information from Andronicus. And this hectic week, I just, sometimes I channel this stuff and it looks a little sloppy, and you notice that, uh, that JP might be reading or I might be reading it, and it's really my writing. It's not, it's, it's that sometimes I'm not able to clean it up and I'm trying to get the information out and, um, fumbling over maybe it's grammar or just, it just doesn't make any sense, the wrong words in the wrong place. That's, so It's um, happening live, baby. It's happening live. <laughs> it is <laughs> happening live. And, and you know, it can be a, a bit confusing, so. Um, that, that's what's, what's going on. And so right now I'm trying to transfer. Hi, hello, JP. Hi. <laughs> trying to, trying to transfer this stuff over to you. And, uh. Okay. Well, while I'm reading Borkum, you, you got the time to, uh, to push them. Push well, them I over. think we both have to read Borkum. So, um. Oh, okay. But, but, you know, I mean, so far it's been, it's, I mean, it's it's something else, you know, the all the stuff that's going on here, and you're really going to enjoy, not enjoy, but I mean, it's it's going to be fascinating because I was pretty fascinated when a lot of this stuff came up, and I think I have it right here. I'm going to transfer that over to you, JP. That um, this is uh, from Metis. Okay, sure good. I have this one. Yep. Oh, there's okay. Andronicus again. Right, good, good. <laughs> I feel a bit disoriented when Andronicus isn't around. Well, this one, this one is actually Metis. This first one that I sent you, and I haven't gotten the Andronicus one yet, but I think we need to um, finish up with Metis, and then we'll uh, probably take a break. And I'm really feeling that we'll, we'll go into... Um, uh, Andronicus after that, and then we'll go to Borkum last, because I think Borkum is something that you're going to want to think about. So, um, okay. were you able to get the Andronicus I've one got, about, uh, from me? I've got Andronicus 30 here. 30. Okay, so this is transmission part 30, um, and then we have probably transmission part 31, and then uh, I would call it No Rodan. No Rodan this week because he was very unhappy about um, what happened with uh, David Bowie. And, um, you know, he just didn't want to speak with me. So um, I we'll just We'll have to get into that, that as well later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Been, it's it, been a week, hasn't it? It has. It has. It doesn't feel like it. So, yeah, well, just for the people that are listening, um, Rodan told me that, that, um, maybe, of course, David Bowie had his biological parents here, but his soul was the child between him and Marin. And Marin was the one that was connected to High Brazil. Oh. So, um, he is, uh, he'll explain, what his feelings are, I think at some point when he does, then I'll share it with everyone. But um, there is apparently some incarnated relatives of Rodan's that he's been watching over, and so um, 
he can explain that for himself. I don't want to get into what he has to say. So, um, did you get the Andronicus transmission part 30 yet, JP? Yep. Okay. Should we get started? Yep. All right. So this is the experience of Midas. <laughs> I know you like the magical harp thing. Yes, I do. <laughs> I observed a man in a strange silver spacesuit moving er- energy around him. The outfit reminded me of the rings on the suit, like the old cartoon, the Jetsons. And they were sort of like the rings of Saturn around each limb. I think people know what I'm talking about. The man that who I was observing, I believe, was uh, Rodan, but he had he looked different this time. He had white hair, but not as white as in old, but rather just white as if he had a different appearance or expression of his who he is. And I knew at that moment we were in another space, maybe even another time and space. I knew we must be in a place called Tartarus. They were calling it Tartarus. It was distinctly different from Tristar X. There was a clearly red hue on the planet to the degree that it seemed artificial, but it wasn't. The extreme color was due to the fact that there was a large amount of red terrain in plant life that seemed to reflect off of itself to create this odd hue of red light. Maybe our uh, human eyes are not trained to view large amounts of the color red. We are clearly adapted to large amounts of blue, as in the sky and green, as in plant life or planet Earth. This red color is much more beyond the distinguishable iconic field of red poppies. It had a feeling of soft edges and gradations of color without it appearing orange or pink and it was a soft foam of red. I oh, see so you have found me again, young untamed flower. Oh, God, he's turned into the Alan Rickman. <laughs> I'm telling Alan Rickman. <laughs> young untamed flower, you have surprised me with your ability to, to discover hidden truths beyond most others' grasp. If only I could squeeze the juice from you, then I could gain some insight into what makes you continue to search when many others have already quit. I know you're not following me for the sake of love, but out of curiosity as to what I'm doing. They never brought you to these regions, I wonder why. Many have visited Tartarus. It is a vicious place to try and survive on. I wasn't searching for you, only Andronicus. However, you continue to get in my way. I thought we have agreed to get out of each other's field. Oh, my little red lotus flower. Your devoted commitment has won you your favour with the powers on your planet. They help you to see beyond your earthly skies and deep into the cosmos. If only I could find the purpose of our gathering, then I might see the value in our conversation. I will say I do find you intriguing. So many have failed at what you are doing now. None have gone this far, and yes, many have tried. What is your anger towards me? Is it my off-settling setting world or indifference to your concern? Neither. I'm, I'm merely searching for Andronicus, and you continue to appear instead. I'll admit, I find your experiences to be intriguing. Why is everything so red? It is the heat of the planet, the heat of the plants themselves. We are turning red from them. I partook of the red lotus, the scorpion bite. The fire orchid, my innards are aflame. I cannot rest as I did on Tristar. My mind races and I need to move. I feel as I am walking on the tips of a flame that follows me wherever I go. I cannot consume enough liquid to alleviate the parchedness in my throat. I was told that this planet would awaken me from my strange hallucinations brought on by the green plants that poison my body. I had begun to morph into something other than my natural form and swell up like a puffer fish. You know, I had a huge influence on your planet at that time. In some ways I still do, but different doors are now opened. I am your friend, but not your friend. You interfere with my initiative on the planets. I don't like interference. It halts my efforts from obtaining free reign and sovereignty. You know, we are all striving for expansion of persuasion. Mine far outreaches the galaxy. 
You, however, have no expansion other than a natural reach to your soul group. I have blocked you from reaching those who need to hear from you. It is my incentive to prevent you from being in front of the masses. I don't care if I'm not in front of the masses. I don't have the ego or need of praise as you do. You keep digging a deeper hole for me. <laughs> they have changed my name to Cletus. I am a mockery for getting soil. <laughs> I am a mockery for getting caught sending influences to your planet. Now they are charging me with galactic treason. I don't have any interest in mutiny and sorts. I merely want the pleasures that fill my mind with strange and unordinary distractions. I am aware that I have been over-indulgent with the plant pleasures. Uh, they make me free from so many other discomforts. Why do they call you Cletus? What is your actual purpose in... Or do you have one? Oh, uh, I do have a purpose. It is my right to explore and seek out new worlds. Someone must explore the outer regions where the environment is less than hospitable. This was my agreement with Rodan when he discovered that his challenges did not stir me as it did others. I have rather found it all intriguing. My many hours of illusions brought me great placidness. I gained further insights into the curious realms of nothingness. As I feel now, while speaking to you, nothingness. How, is, how are you influencing our planet now? I can see that you're, you have influenced our planet through music, musicians and lyrics, tones and styles. You have given agendas, rebellions and strange expressions and influences that replicated your strange planet fascination. What does the Red Lotus do, or the Fired Orchid, etc.? You see, my naive friend, you have not indulged a plant matter as I have. Although there was a time when you indulged heavily into barbiturates and other forms of it, through my influence during another lifetime or two, you would much more. You would be much more interesting and amusing then. Right now, I feel uninterested by your questions. Okay. To satisfy your interest in my experience I gained. Then I heard a door in a strange view as if I was looking at a mirror of a door that continued deeper into multiple doors and the sound of someone falling. I imagine it was Midas who fell and the influence behind it was Rodan. I believe he was about to talk about a forbidden sub subject regarding the plants on Tartarus and was cast out of the range of communication. He was shut out of his own doors. He was taken from an echo chamber that reached all dimensions of time space, and now his influence was diminished to only four, four doors. The four doors reached to Rodan, Andronicus, back in time where he could view or relive his previous experiences without the ability to alter it, and into the future, into April 8, 2016, the date had been set. I heard and saw a book close, and heard Rodan say, One down, four more to go. I wasn't sure what that meant. Not to meet us. <laughs> so, that's weird. <laughs> what the heck? Um, so, you know, it's like every every minute is another turn, you know, so, uh, uh, we so, just don't get along. I, I just, he doesn't like you, does he? You know, I'm, I'm getting, I'm totally Alan, Alan, uh, Rickman. <laughs> I'm just, he's, he is so an Alan Rickman character. It's great. So, so thank you, Alan, for that. Uh, maybe one of them's <laughs> going to be David Bowie. Maybe Rodan should be more David Bowie. <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see if I can find, um, the other Andronicus, but I mean, meanwhile, I mean, why don't you? What are your thoughts? I mean, is that weird or what? Well, you he's know, he's a weird character, Venus. He's he very certainly strange. is. He is very strangeness indeed. Um, <laughs> so, first of all, uh, where are we? We're we're um, we open, and you're looking at a, a guy in a white suit, a silver space suit, um, yep. 
uh, had white hair. Was it? Did he have a bubble helmet, or, or was it? Was no, it, he just had the helmet off, but he was still he wearing had the, the suit. suit. Just like remember the Jetsons, and they had those like loops around the sleeves. Uh-huh. You know, it's almost like Saturn-like kind of. Like uh, it Constantina it, flexing, flexing port things to so make it flexible. I don't know what. I, right. I, I don't think it. I don't know if it had a purpose at all. Usually, other than yeah. it just looked like a spacesuit, and then the type of spacesuit that we somehow have in our consciousness as a spaceman. Mm-hmm. So maybe he wore that when he was on the Earth plane. Yeah. It was probably one of his outfits. So there's Rodan with white hair. So this is a future Rodan, possibly. It might have been a past, future. I can't, I couldn't yeah. tell. Okay, it was, so it was really hard. And then you say you're in a place called Tartarus. They called it Tartarus. They moved him out of TriStar X, which was all green. And that's where he turned green. And then, um, and then he was in, then they moved him over to Tartarus afterwards. Hmm. So, yes, it's interesting. So, um, you're in this kind of red environment that is caused by the heat. Obviously, um, the, the ground makes us see blue. I don't know what happens in, on Earth, but, uh, it, they may be around a red sun, uh, you know, uh, what is actually a, a hot a hot sun, because our sun is a cold sun. It's uh, it's light. It's not hot. But anyway. Yeah. So Tartarus, and there's some uh, some pretty psychedelic plants. I mean, basically, it sounds like Meters is a bit of a stoner. You know, he likes to, he, he takes lots of trips and acid head and, you know, he's like a Grateful Dead fan or something. Yeah, and might have, you know, that that's the type of thing that he likes. Um, likes a rush. Probably a sixth rate personality. I, well, I mean, think about it. He's, he's the, a brother or something to Andronicus and Andronicus just likes the senta- sensations, the um, pleasures. Sensuality. Maybe, yeah. Yep. And and you can't quite separate them from that. That's the part of. It, I think that they also lived in a contrast of everything. There was a lot of pain too. I mean, they were um, going into places where it was less than comfortable. You know what I'm saying? It was just. Yeah, host- hostile terrains and and things like that. And he was saying, yeah. you know, um, uh, that he was he was adapted to being like Hardy. You know, they 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 probably you know got thicker skins and stuff like that. Yeah, or yeah, there the, was the, like a um, high threshold to pain. Um, they're uh, part of the journeyman process of being an Andromedan. I think is your kind of nomadic in a way and so yeah you're you're accustomed to being without food sources um a survivor you know essentially a, a survivor of some sort but i think that for me this it got ramped up and so maybe in, in, even andronicus and where they just said you know oh wow in contrast look at that feeling of pleasure and so they they would go to an extreme whenever they encountered something that made them feel good so not they take know, it all the way they they turn it out to ten <laughs> yeah and, and it's just like you know there's some humans that I mean we um, we're they're, we're very akin to their experience and so when when we you've met people that are indulgent like this in the same way because they're trying to deal with maybe a trauma or something that was uncomfortable or unhappy in their life and so they get excessive with alcohol it could be even sex or food something and so it sounds like you know these these are all the same attributes of a person that's that's reaching out it has some kind of pain or whatever and so yeah i'm going back and forth with me this and i know he's irritating me and i'm irritating him and he's like well why are you here and i'm like i don't want to be here <laughs> so i don't know for some reason we had to have that information but it was almost like he was in the portal that where it was typically open for me to communicate with Andronicus, and he was there instead. And that's why I wasn't able to get through to Andronicus. Does that make sense? So. That's my... 
Yeah, that was my interpretation of it. And and it sounded like Rodan was kind of like watching and he was supposed to be just doing this stuff and going through that experience. It sounded like Tartarus was really, really uncomfortable for him to be there. Uh, and I was a perfect person to vent it on. And then as he started to reveal some information about Tartarus that wasn't supposed to be revealed, Rodan just pulled him right out. Yeah. And that was the end of it. So, so... Uh, the other thing is this kind of enmity that he has for you personally. You know, it's really <laughs> rather, rather disturbing, you know. Um, and he keeps calling you, you know, young, untamed flower. And they say, if only I could squeeze the juice from you, then I could gain some insight into what makes you yeah. continue to search when many others would have already quit. <gasps> and, you know, I know you're not following me for the sake of love, but out of curiosity as to what I'm... And, like, no, you're not at all. <laughs> it's, it's, it's nothing at all to do with what he's, and it's like there's there's this kind of enormous cosmic mis mistake. You know, he's he's not taking you for what your what what your intention is, or what's going on. Have you got any insights into that? I mean, it seems to yeah. be really strange. He knows that he's blocking me from Andronicus. He knows that I'm looking for Andronicus, and I keep on reiterating that, and he keeps on assume, he keeps on mentioning that I'm looking for him. And then he keeps, but he knows that he's in the space that's blocking me from seeing Andronicus. So he's just, he's being an irritant, but it's not hurting me, it's not hostile. It is to some degree, but it's, emotionally it's not bothering me, because I know that he's, um, it, he's playing a game. You know, making it look like I'm chasing him when I'm not. Making it look like I'm fascinating with what he's doing, which is a form of wanting to get attention. Yeah. Do you know what it is? It reminds me of, uh, and again, we, we, I look at Star Trek. Um, there's uh, Diana Troy's mother, who was always taunting Jean-Luc Picard. She was, she was supposed to be, like, reading his, his mind, and she said, Oh, Jean-Luc, you shouldn't think of things like that. And he's like, Oh, what? What? Hey, did I, I didn't. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, he was eyeing up Sulu. You know, um, <laughs> it seems. Anyway, um, so, yeah, so there's a sort of uh, little attention game going on. Oh, you're really attracted to me, aren't you? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. Uh, I find you quite repulsive. Well, but anyway, anyway, that sort of... No, you, know. you want my brother, not me. Yeah, so that's okay. right. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's it's kind of a game. It's gotten to be a game, and he knows it, and he knows that he's he's gotten under my skin, and and um, or I, I kind of accidentally you know blew the whistle on him, but not trying to. But because I'm like, hey, you know, what are you doing here? And then before you know it, Rodan shows up and then he gets in trouble, you know, because that's, he got in trouble. That's why he was sent out of, uh, he was caught leaving TriStar X, the green planet, and then traveling, you know, somehow getting into a portal of, of um, the Earth plane during our time period. So now he's, you know, maybe, with a risk of, of doing it again or still somehow doing it, um, you know, Rodan's just catching him doing some things because I'm in, I'm seeing it and it's almost like somehow Rodan's knowing what I'm seeing and saying. So. Maybe he's causing you that's to witness what I think's it. Happening. Maybe he's causing you to witness these things that he's doing. It could be. It could be he's trying to get away with it or thinking he's sneakily letting me know what he, you know, his his uh, you know, few words or comments <laughs> that he wants to get through to me, and then um, instead he's getting in trouble. Hmm. Well, Rodan's not particularly friendly towards you either. Uh, yeah, Rodan's okay. <laughs> he's all right. But he's he's kind of like if you if you cross over a boundary, he'll let you know. Yeah. yeah. And he's not, you know, very, very... Um, skittish about saying whatever he's on his mm -hmm, mind mm -hmm. but he, by no means is anyone does anyone talk to me like Metis does yeah, mince his words he does not but uh, yeah Metis is like he, he's so he's like really condescending and like oh my little red lotus flower yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's annoying yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah and, and even to Andronicus remember how he was very antagonistic towards Andronicus mm. I can't stand you it just you know went on and on and on it's the same thing yeah he's not a nice person he's an angry person mm. 
<laughs> or Andromedan. <laughs> yeah, that's like, right. It's, it's like in that movie Elf. You, you know, you're an angry elf. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, and then he's called Cletus. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, he gets called Fetus, right? Yeah. <laughs> As he, ah, he's a regressive. He's a regressive. He's what? Because you hear what Ale, uh, what Alex Collier calls their like progressives and regressives, and the regressives look more and more like their ain't you know their sort of reptilian selves, their non-human selves. They so. Uh, is is Metis sort of degenerating in any way in your in your vision of him? Yeah, yeah. He's well I think he's becoming less powerful. He had a tremendous amount of power and was misusing it and so when, what happens when you misuse power? You end up losing it. Uh-huh. And that and that's the hardest part because then you were accustomed to having this power and then you have nothing eventually if you continue on in that path. And so that's what's happening to him. He's he's coming. You know, there's a diminishing returns. Mm. Um, he, you know, is moving, thinking that he's moving forward, but he's he's losing quite a bit and becoming subservient to his circumstances rather than to anyone in particular. Whereas he might have been able to get get out of some of these planets, but he he's be finding it harder and harder to do so. So. Uh, I'd like to take a quick break just now um, okay. and before we go into the next section and I want to play some uh, Eric Clapton um, and this is uh, just exactly it was what you just said can't find my way home Veronicus and uh, actually uh, Metis the experience of Metis and, uh, and you know it continues to expand it's really a um, sad place where Metis was. Um, yeah, could be a little bit hostile, but this is what happens when people sink lower and lower. They become more spiteful and, and angry and bitter about their, that experience and lashing out instead of actually coming to the conclusion that they made those decisions that brought them into the place that they were at and um, still not willing to look around and assess the situation, but Although I don't know how much I could clearly think through everything if I was in a uncomfortable living space like um, Tartarus sounds like. It sounds like it's not really a good place. Sounds a bit um, intense, really, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, uh, you know, I was, I was just uh, going through this. I'm trying to, I was trying to edit a bit. Um, let's see if I can try to send this forward to you again, JP. This is uh, Andronicus. This would be the transmission. I put it as 31 because I didn't know any other way to to add it without, um, you know, because instead I never I should have identified the other ones as Metis one or two or three, and instead um, I put Andronicus as the title for them. So I just did a little bit of editing. Hopefully, this I don't know how good the rest of it is, but. We'll see how it goes. So that's okay. I got it here. Download yeah. that last one. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here we go. <sighs> I'm in a dark space, and I don't know why. There is moisture, and the air is heavy. I think I landed somewhere in an outer region. I can clearly see I'm in a spacecraft and controls that I'm not familiar with. The compression from the craft is making me feel uncomfortable as well as my gasping for air. We breathe differently from you and have a very high tolerance to what you understand as water and other elements intermingled in the atmosphere. Even still, I am gasping. The enclosure seems like it was torn a bit but I am reluctant to venture out for fear that I could introduce a great deal of outer environmental exposure into my space that may create a devastating or terminal experience. My feet feel heavy. Ah, I understand. I must be on Mercury. Can you see around you? Uh, Is there anyone else with you? Maybe uh, they are in hyperspace or they're outside? Oh, I miss you. I miss your warmth. We met in Greece on your planet, but you didn't remember me. 
Really? How did you get there? I don't know. It it is all as a dream. This is what I remember it to be. I was disabled from movement while in the silver tube. At that point, I saw an image of a cigar-shaped spacecraft, made of silver. I was locked in, as if I was in a vice held tightly. I was able to use my mind to make the craft move, and then I brought it into hyperspace into the future. My anxiety and intensity launched me into the human experience. I saw amazing things, civilizations that I didn't know could exist. The humans were intriguing and quite competent. I always perceived them as being below our intellect, but discovered that they have our capacity for survival as we do, yet with much more constraint. We are more moved by our instincts and desires. To survive in galactic conditions, this heightened instinct gave us a stronger desire for survival. The separation is the human cycle of rebirth. We are not in that system. Our, rem- our memory remains unlimited. I am curious about this system. Humans seem to be untainted by early trauma and can let go of many challenges. I think they expect that you will out-survive us. Now I know why. Andronicus, can we start from the beginning? So you said that you traveled into our future in space, in the spacecraft that Rodan put you in, um, and he was in control, or you were in control? <laughs> yes, he called me a blunder. Unfortunately, the name stuck to me, but I am a very powerful intellect, and it is my honesty that they abhor. I feel that the others do not have their knowing of reality in its proper, pers- in its proper perspective. I agree, I have been a nuisance. Rodan is not a simple guardian to deal with. He's highly complex and one can never quite appease him if you had once offended him. I foolishly challenged him instead of working with his protocol and following his guidelines on Satar. If I had, I would have moved on to Venus instead of Mars. I'm not sure. It is hard to retrace the original plan. Like all original plans, there are sometimes alternative avenues of directions, and I think that this had brought me to a pleasingly interesting path, despite the hardships and trauma and lack of commas. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I felt my own original path was too mundane in many ways. You, where are you now? What are your coordinates? Maybe I can come to you. I don't know. Maybe the date and location would suffice. Uh, do you know where the Sirius region is of Dogon? Yes. Can you see where it is located in your skies? I will look for it. All you need to do is speak to it. You have an ancient home and temple there. I found it a while back. You are amongst the ancients prior to my time. We wondered why Rodan and Zamphire had such interest in you. They have been discreet regarding your whereabouts and have warned me not to interfere with your life where you are at now. You've already interfered, and so have others. My life has been a challenge and difficult in many ways. I'm sorry you feel that way. It was time for you to awaken. When one remembers who they were and why they are here, they become disrupted and disabled from enjoying their life in a simple form. It becomes more task-oriented and sleepless nights of unending riddles. Is that what you were speaking about? That and more. Let me adjust a few more things for you. There. I reset a few signals from Greece. You had a few who were still accessing your information and manipulating souls around you. That piece shall end. It was clearly my interference that did that. Are you at risk of helping me or even contacting me now with Rodan and Zamphir? Yes, I am. But it will help them all if I do. I stepped beyond you into the future. You need my help at this time. The Earth is at risk at this time. 
You and Primus are holding the balance while others step through to help. Many others are beginning to remember as well. Soon the heightened alarm will pass. I open the door to the vessel and I am safe. Mercury has strange forces here, like a pulling and pushing sensation all at once. My feet feel very heavy. The atmosphere seems to move backwards and forwards like a clock. I also feel a sinking sensation, like I was going down into the planet. Oh, my, my son described something like that in a dream he had. Yes, he knows it as well. The ancient created these planets to balance the other more habitable spaces. They are like weights on a pulley or scale. It's the science of the universe that humans don't seem to be able to grasp yet. They have more time to evolve. They believe that the information comes from education alone. This is where the mistake comes in. The information is released through consciousness. The expansion comes through a reverence for our universe. This is the universal law of the Vegas. They form the universe in this manner. The universe where Imogene exists is under another guideline, as well as other universes much more rogue in nature. This is the reason why Rodan and Zamphire and Kalib, all the sons of Shiva and others, are trying to keep out the outside forces who are not allowing humans to ascend to their proper planetary position. Some have questioned your knowledge because of your interest in sexual encounters and other problems, such as claiming to be a deity in Greece. Well, we're from another race, a guardian race or sojourner race, who, who help maintain the balance of the universe. There are no laws or guidelines that forbid us from helping the human race. Our Syrian brothers made the mistake of trying to advance the humans before their consciousness awakened, and they were greatly reprimanded by the Vegas. The Catritons came and disassembled their portal and crafts. It is now a closed issue and without any further discussion. My interaction with the humans during the Greek and Roman times created some confusion, but also created systems of organization, sanitary living, population growth, your political structure of open forums for discussion and decision-making. These are all Andromedan processes. Many even embraced our communal sharing and bartering. That gave way to a monetary system as you know it today. Sibu was right in saying we are as cousins and have grown fond of your species. We are also amazed to see how so many of the ancients intermingled amongst you in this great expansion of a race. I am pleased to have been part of it. You know, I know Primus, or JP, would like to know about the torture you rendered to him for stealing the fire and bringing it to humans. I also have seen others who suffer by the hand of Zeus. Please explain that to us. None of that happened under my rule. I came as a benevolent being to help instill new thoughts and theory. I will say, I was generous with my lovers and had much interaction with the people at the time. Some of them have a memory of my presence. You were hidden at first, and then I saw you awakened. Primus was my dear friend. He came when he discovered that the Catritons were sent to clear some disharmony with intruders of another race. They came from a far-off region called Krakus. It is another universe, and different from Imogene as well. They attacked you and Primus and others who would not bend a knee to their aggression. These are the Vincala. They are military rulers, and humiliation is their craft. I didn't want to mention them for fear that they may target the both of you again. I know you have been instructed to be a moving target. Never stay in one place for any length of time. This has protected you. Primus was instructed to stay put. He has also listened well. We, along with the Catritons have defeated or disabled much of the Vincala and their senseless aggression. We think it might be an unusual pull in their stratosphere that is causing a similar effect to your lunar experience. So you were saying you had nothing to do with Primus Teos's hardship and the birds picking at his liver? 
This is barbaric behavior that is not of my nature, nor will it ever be. Though I have been angry, I would never lash out at my friends. The deception is the control of what happened that caused me to leave and they took over. I think they are fearful of the human intellect and capability. They do not want the humans to gain power galactically, universally, and with the multi -verse, and with the multiverse as well. I am here to help you to help those around you. I'm sorry that I was disconnected from you from a, for a crucial time period. I heard much strange activities occurred. Allow me to search for a few solutions to these matters. Please tell my brother Primus that I feel his pain and send healing love to him. I also apologize for my brother Metis's bad behavior. He doesn't mean to cause hardship. He's merely in a dark space and is longing for companionship. He thought that he could stir Primus's memory of him. This is a greeting we are all accustomed to. How did you get on Mercury? And are you okay? Yes, I am no longer the hollow man. I can feel, see, breathe and move freely again. I am grateful and joyous for that. I know you are weary. Can we speak more about what happened in Greece later? Of course, and so much more. Your world is now ready to hear the truth. Much love. 8853, 25 billion light years away now in time-space continuity structures. The envelope of source energy has unfolded and brought much light to our stratosphere. I am now able to see. Brilliant. Okay. Well, there you go. There we go. So, it was Metis. Who it was Metis that did what? It was Metis who pretended to be Zeus, who... No, it was the Vincala. The Vincala. The Vincala came in and took over. Um, I saw I saw Andronicus walking around ancient Greece. Yeah. He was just like walking around like a regular person. He he had it wasn't like any ego. It was he just wanted to meet everyone, and then eventually he became more powerful. Um, somehow he got through out of. It was like a cigar shaped spacecraft. That's what the tube was. But he was too too large for it, or something. So he was it's like stuffed into a, stuffed yeah. into a spacecraft that uh, was was like a kind of maybe like a torpedo or something. Yeah. And uh, sent to a planet. What a bugger! Just hey, you remember? Oh, sorry, um, remember? That's Rhoda. Rhoda. That's Rhoda. <laughs> <that's Rodian. laughs> Spock. You remember the search for Spock? That's what they did to him to bury Spock in space. They did that to Spock. Yeah, in, um, what is it, number three, I think, Spock dies. I will remem remain, as always, your friend. <laughs> you know that one. Anyway, live long and prosper. No, I don't think I see I didn't see that one. So, All what right. happens then? It's a cigar-shaped craft? Uh, he's, um, he's, uh, sent, he's buried in space, so they stick him in a, and they scoop out the warhead of a photon torpedo and, um, stick it in the, there, and that's his space coffin. Uh, and they send him into space, and he uh, eventually lands on a planet that just happens to be um, Captain Kirk's son's um, uh, gen Genesis experiment, which uh, oh, wow. is a... Uh, he, he creates a Genesis bomb, of course, because he's an American, and Americans need to have a bomb. Okay, so he creates a Genesis bomb that uh, goes boom, and the whole planet goes from brown to green. Um, and, of course, this revives whatever living material is it left into Spock, who's been irradiated to crap. But uh, he seems to return as a boy who grows and uh, learns and becomes Spock again. Uh, because just before he left, he downloaded his consciousness into Dr. McCoy with his uh, Vulcan mind meld. He could do that. So he, he basically left his body and hung out and, and um, possessed uh, Dr. McCoy. A little bit of Star Trek lore there for you. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Oh, I love Spock. 
<laughs> Fascinating. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so here's his confession time, huh? So now, now yeah. we got it out in the open. All right. So what happened was, whatever that portal was, or whatever connection that that Zeus come, you know, comes through and communicates. So I, I believe that um, Andronicus somehow leaves that reality and then someone steps in claiming to be Zeus because as you see it was almost like they worshipped him and they appreciated him and at some point um, everything went downhill he was the bad guy yeah at and some point the was, gods got bad yeah then, well, they were fighting with the titans and everything well, yeah. yeah yeah well ah there we go Hello. perfect timing here we are welcome back uh, so yes um <laughs> I, I seem to be getting hit every couple of... Uh, whenever I'm, I have a broadcast schedule, then I start losing internet connection. All the rest of the time, you know, I'm playing podcasts, not a problem. Anyway, so let's keep it happy. Uh, it, it's not bad. It's been 50 minutes between uh, connections. So, uh, Jess, where were we? Yes. Um. Well... I think we were talking about Spock. <laughs> Spock. Oh yes, and, and um, well, basically that uh, Andronicus was was basically um, stuck in this uh, tor- something like a torpedo tube. That yeah. Uh, w- eventually lands on a planet. Cigar-shaped uh, spacecraft that's silver-looking. Yeah. Well, like that's like a, you know that's that, like a torpedo. You know, yeah. uh, it's a metal metal tube uh, with a point, <laughs> and um, and it lands on a planet. And smack, and he wakes up, and uh, steps out, and it's um, he's on Mercury. Well, that must be a bit. He doesn't of a know how he got him. there. He was disoriented. He had yeah. no idea how he got there. I still haven't gotten a straight answer as to why. I don't think he knows what oh. the answer is. I, I think that was the answer. They stuck him in a torpedo. <laughs> they fired him out into space. <laughs> well, they, they originally stuck him in a torpedo. He was facing the sun and. And following the the sun's rotation early on. Oh, maybe he went into the sun and went through the portal. It could have been, and then he ended up through time space, and somehow he got control of it and realized that he can uh, maneuver the spacecraft with his mind, and then ended up um, somewhere in somewhere in our human history of uh, ancient Greece, where he starts walking around the population pretty fascinated by everything and then they recognize that he is uh, somehow he gets the name Zeus I don't know how Uh, the impression that I got and this is not in anything that was written the impression that I got was the sound of his craft made the Zeus sound ah Zeus yeah Uh the man who came from Zeus (laughs) yeah I mean that's that's the only thing, Andronicus, I mean, unless uh, the way he was pronouncing Andronicus was also, um, I don't know. I mean, it just, I kind of got the impression as they just heard that booming sound uh, that sounded like Zeus. Interesting. So, And I gave him that name. So that's Zeus and um, and his relationship well, I mean, here's the thing: is he talks about going into hyperspace and goes into the future. Um, but does that mean that he he went into his future, which is our past? Is that what you're saying here? Yes. Yeah, because he he really, you know, all this other stuff that happened with you know Sector Four Three Eight, um, his visit to Neptune. Um, the whole uh, visit on uh, Saturn, that was all way before the human experience existed. But what happened was, Borkum, Gupta, they went way ahead of everyone. And they started going through the timelines. And then somehow, Midas started accessing it as well. And a lot of it started, I don't know if Neptune was the launching pad for some of that. Because Zamfir uh, moved into the uh, future and went into the inner Earth, so Zamfir seemed to have have had that connection. Maybe they followed after him in some way. You know, if he's the one that created the portal. 
So hang on, uh, Zampha created the portal from where to where? From Neptune. Right. To um, present day Earth. Or early Earth, you know, I think he just kind of settled in there. And that undoubtedly raised um, the human race and consciousness and evolution. Because he brought all his information and had um, a presence on the planet, although he was not typically revealing who he was. Like, like Andronicus, you know, asserting himself as a deity... Uh, I don't think Zanfair ever really did that. I think he just created an influence. He could influence anything he wanted. You know, he had tremendous power, and he has a lot of illusion. And I would say that the lifetimes that were very, very full of illusion, like like Avalon or, um, you know, some of the mystery religions that came through um, and alchemy and things of that nature, uh, I would say that Zanfair had an impact on that. Maybe uh, some of the sacred sites. So he he may have manifested as say some of the great magician or um, uh, not, not what's the opposite of magician um, uh, warlock, you know, someone like that. Yeah, I mean like, he's much uh, more advanced Sauron than that. I mean he's, he's like the you know the great. Um, let me say it. Just just you know I mean he can create planets. He can create. Uh, a race of beings. He, he doesn't really need anything. So he's, he's not at a lower level. He's above, much above Andronicus. And he's much more discreet. You notice he doesn't talk to me about what he does. Um, the other piece that I hadn't talked about is that I think that Midas might have been the green man. I uh, remember the, the lore about the green man showing up in various places. What, the um, pan or something? No. Oh, the green man. The jolly green giant. Yeah, that might have been Metis. Metis. With his skin turning all green. I don't know for sure about that. That was the impression that I got. Hmm. That he came into our human experience a few times through portals. And, of course, he wouldn't have altered himself. He couldn't. At that time, he didn't alter himself. He showed himself as the way he looked, and he was his skin was green. Little green men or big green men, yes. Yeah, I mean, you look in the, uh, and what's really interesting, the green man always looks like he's going through some kind of trauma, like you know, like the plants are coming out of his body or out of his mouth, and he always looks like his eyes are wild and. Um, imagine somebody coming through a portal <laughs> and they're all green and they're wondering what they're doing and everyone else is looking at them like well, what is that you know maybe he just sticks his head through it he's always coming through it, a round thing isn't it yeah <laughs> hello <laughs> what's going on here <laughs> why is that man green <laughs> yeah. scary hairy face yeah yeah so um yeah, so Metis has many, many faces as well, you know. He does. He somehow, he, that's why people say, you know, it's, that's evil or that's of the devil. Well, there, there's a bunch of devils then. <laughs> All different kinds of, you know, emergences of, of, um, spacemen coming through that would, you know, because of our lack of understanding what they were going through, we would, we would say that it was just some kind of, you know, really evil thing, but it's just, it was just odd. It was unusual to our experience. They weren't necessarily here to harm us and probably were equal, equally startled mm. by the interaction as they were. So <laughs> it makes it very interesting. Yeah, it does. So, to All right, so get, getting back to Andronicus. Indeed, right? yeah, go on. So Andronicus shows up. He's still in his craft. He starts communicating, and they, they create this um, temple. He's communicating with this priest who realizes that he is a lonely traveler and dresses as a female to um, seduce him because he's asking for a female, right? So instead of getting another female, he just dresses himself 
as a female. And they have some kind of romantic encounter and, uh, and then all this power exchange goes to this person who is human by the name of uh, Aten, um, who we, I believe, was the name Athena. Um, and then later on becomes Akhenaten. Um, but somehow he gets free of that and just starts roaming around and having little affairs here and there. And um not really sure what happens after that. At some point, I think Rodan pulls him out of there, out of the future. And then he ends up over in Mercury in a completely different spacecraft. He does not recognize the spacecraft at all. He doesn't know how he got there. And But he does recognize the terrain and his knowledge of Mercury somehow he he knows about it and he starts to tell me what he experienced and finally we're at a place where we can connect but you notice we couldn't connect while Medus was coming through because Medus was somehow in the portal where I was communicating with him but getting back to ancient Greece and Rome um, it sounds like the Vincala were there at the same time and then so were the Titans and so the Titans were there to try to probably also experiencing being with humans you know have probably posing as you know some of these other deities that we know about and uh, you know there's a whole pantheon of them uh, but then the Vincala somehow step in and uh, there's there's this, this battle that takes place and it's really potentially with the the titans and the vincala rather than what they said was you know in the gods and and i don't know i mean all i know is andronicus left so i don't really know the backstory but i'm, I'm kind of trying to piece it together i have to ask more questions So, <laughs> he says he's in Sirius, then. Yeah, he said that he's connect. he knows the Syrians. He's not in Syria, but he knows the Syrians, and at some point spend time with them. Remember, he was... Um, he was Seth. And Rodian called himself Osiris. Right, so what we Yeah, we're going to have to bring this guy in who's got... Some guy has done a, like a history of all the people who... All the names of the different... Yeah, all the different gods who moved from... Uh, Greece to Rome and all that stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So, hang on, so let me adjust a few more things for you, he says. There, I reset a few signals from Greece. Did you feel anything when he said that? I felt like something lifted. That some, some of, I think, the people, people were carrying some of these energies around me where I was feeling resistance. And... Um, I felt like I was just picking up discordant um, energies. And to be honest with you, I think it was mostly the woman that he had affairs with in Greece that created problems with me. Jealous exes? Yes. Jealous Greek exes? You don't want to know? No. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So I think that's what what it was. I mean, he had a trail of women there, just like he did in Neptune. And, of course, they fought amongst each other and then came after me. All right. Um, but he, he said he left the portal open to me, and then they were able to access it because he was gone. But also, here again, the Vincala could find me too, couldn't they? So it would have been exposed you. 
yeah, and it could explain a lot of the very strange visions, um, the attacks that I've had in my sleep, um, all the different things that had happened over the course of the years in my life, um, which, unfortunately, I didn't have any knowledge of this. And was, you know, just going through these experiences thinking it was just very strange. And now a lot of it's making sense. So, I mean, I guess, um, by him closing that portal would, would make things more at ease. More, more, more peaceful for me. And it does feel slightly better. Yeah. But not significantly better, but, you know, less problems, but it was really ramped up there for a while. So. Any type of relief I'm grateful for. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that uh, personally, I've, I've felt a, a greater connection. Um, it's like that there was an interfering signal that has been taken out of the way. That's that's how it, it mm-hmm. appears to be for me in the last few days. Um, and so here's the, the earth is at risk you know, so what is this you need my help at this time the earth is at risk did you get what what we're at risk from the bear with yeah. i'll put my teeth and my brain back in the same proportion uh, <laughs> uh, yes uh yes yes oh, uh, well I I, I, at the time i didn't know what it meant when i read it and down. when i wrote it down okay so again um, at the time, I wasn't aware of what he was talking about, about the Earth being at re- risk. And now, um, and then I wrote about, uh, the transmission from Borkum today. And I believe that's the answer. That would bring us, that's why I had it in the sequence that we read it. So we were kind of getting some closure about Midas and some of his, um, frustrations in his connection to the planet through us and then after that um Andronic is expressing some of the things that he was going through and at least coming through and and telling us about what he felt about humans and how that we're growing and how we have potential and and then um bringing in whatever the challenges are now at our later date many years after ancient Greece and Rome that we're facing another situation. So he's jumping through time, communicating with us until um, then Borkum came through and filled in that little missing piece so we can see what we were dealing with. And so... Oh, I know I've got the wrong... You you seem to have this uh, high pitched uh, chirping sound behind you. Have you, have you got something yeah. that's uh, got a battery that is? Near? Yes, I need to put a battery in that. If you hold on one second, yeah. I'll be right back. Yeah, you can continue talking, and then we'll so, go into Borkum. Yeah. So, um, well, there's Borkum. Now I can't rem- trying to remember what Borkum's accent was. Um, now Borkum, <laughs> if I remember, was sort of Borkum is exciting. And- he was loud and yeah. He was bar- he was they uh, Andronicus called him Barkum. So yeah. Like, oh, yeah, right, yeah, all right, yeah, all right, yeah, all right. Okay, yeah, he's a bit. There like, you oh, go. Oh, <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Ah, <laughs> hang on, let me just stretch my mouth a bit. Ah, okay. ah, 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 ah. <laughs> all right, all right, yeah, all right, hey, all right, yeah, I'm great. Pirate like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, a bit there. <laughs> let me get rid of the chirping bird. Yeah, I'll be yeah, right back. yeah. Deal with the bird. It's the bird. It's the bird. It's the phone. Don't set him off. So, yes, um, hey, it's cool to have you all in the chat room there. there we got a nice little, uh, little crew here. Let me just have a, have a, a quick look at the old list here. So, yes, Alexander from Germany, Cray UK, Rackmeister, Roby Doby, Shebe Bright Eyes, True Magic, Vanessa, and some Wolf Spirit host fella. Anyway, hey. yeah. So, hello everybody it's it's really nice i mean we used we used to play to an empty room sometimes you know uh <laughs> back in the day <laughs> mm-hmm. but it's really good we have a more and more of a live audience and uh sorry about the disconnections i'm doing my best to uh get a better broadband service i live in the sticks um but <laughs> not that far from you know i live like two kilometers where they've just put a new broadband thingy in and so all i need is you know uh, they say, you know, 
if you want to, you can pay for it. And it's like ten thousand pounds a kilometre. So I'd need to raise twenty thousand pounds to uh, to get a, a fibre broadband to my door. But I don't think it's it would cost that money. I think uh, we can get it done for nothing. I think well, maybe uh, someone wants to donate, and people yeah. who are want to support the work that you do, we're going to just put that out there. If someone knows of anyone that wants to send money for a good cause keep this network going and keep it strong so we can have you know live broadcasts i'm just going to put it out there not just to those that are listening live but mm. for anyone that is enjoying and appreciating um the information that's coming through your network not just uh, wolf spirit radio but ever beyond and any other networks you're affiliated with that you utilize your uh all, all of your technology from your space so if anyone wants to donate, please please do that. Yeah. Do find a donate button the somewhere. Uh, yeah. it's, on, it's on the main page on uh, Wall Spirit Radio. Um, and, you know, you can donate and subscribe as well. Um, that's a separate thing, but the subscription uh, gives you access to the archives, which are massive, huge, all yeah. sorts of very, Amazing very interesting stuff. people, luminaries of the now over the last five years, which has been the kind of burgeoning of this whole kind of... Uh, um, consciousness expansion movement, and we have the big names. Um, so, uh, we were talking, we were just about to uh, begin Mr. Borkham's, uh, The World According to Borkham. Yes. <laughs> so, oh, hold on a second. Are, are you starting? Are you reading this? No, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna. St- yeah, I am starting it. All right. Um, but I just wanted to give a background. For those that don't remember, Borkum was the original group of the Titans. He was there with Ketron, Ketriton, and um, and uh, also, uh, let's see, that's where um, Primus Teus was. And so that's Andronicus meets them in Sector 438. And they're very large bodies, very muscular, very strong, um, loud, booming voices. And Borkum is obnoxious, and a lot of people get angry at him, and eventually Rodan takes him in as someone that uh, kind of goes ahead as a scout and goes into the timelines, into the future, and then reports back to him. And you see that um, Andronicus is saved by him when he goes into alternate space and Borkum comes in and gets him but originally Andronicus didn't like him, he called him Barkum and now he, you know, later on he appreciated Borkum, even though Borkum is very different and then we even discover later that Borkum was not originally a Titan although he acted very much like them he was actually from a planet called Emojin, which is another universe, which we had mentioned earlier, Emojin. And it is um, a place that uh, he is probably going to a- end up returning to later in time. But um, this is this is what I got from Borkum today. Okay, you can do the sound again. <laughs> JP. Coming right up, Mas. Mas. <laughs> okay. I was transported into the future where I stood behind Borkum. There before us were quadrants and quadrants of Vincala, the ones you call reptilians. They stood in a formation as far as I could see. The light of a candle could reveal the length and breadth of their species. I often wondered how much, how so much crisis and problems could arise in our world and the depth of confusion that could build amongst our present civilization. Now I see it for myself. It is the very influence that has been invading our consciousness from the inception of humanity and even earlier with other species within our universe. My heart jumped and I was paralyzed by the imminent power that stood before me. My breath was abated, and I observed everything or something that was holding it at bay. It was a man. 
Sorry. There's a man. I wasn't sure because he stood in power and strength, but his hair was so long and full that it covered three quarters of his body. The long black tresses almost made him look much like a creature from behind. When he turned, he observed me standing there, and then I recognized his face as Borkum. He spoke to me telepathically, not to break the mental controls he had on the vast troops before, before him. The whisper went like this. What are you doing here, and how did you get here? He said with a low commanding emotion. I don't know how I got here. I don't know why I'm standing here with you. It seems to happen this way. Remove some of them from here, and I will allow you to stay. He gestured toward the quadrants with an outstretched hand, waving toward them. At that moment, I knew my objective was to not physically approach them, but to find the connecting points where they are disabled. How far into the future am I viewing this potential takeover? You don't know? Look around you. It is not far into your own future. They shouldn't have sent you here. This is not a job for a woman. This isn't a job for a man either. The power should have protected us. Have you betrayed everyone else for your own gain and power? They followed me here. I created them as dogs and they listened. Now there are too many and it is my own undoing that we are in this place now. I cannot move much further in time without taking them with me and potentially creating more. How is it that they are multiplying when you move through the timelines? Is it that you are altering our history or future when you travel? I don't know. At first I saw them as subservient warriors, always there to help me. When they began to multiply, I discovered that they were requiring much more of my focus and I had little else to attend to. I could no longer correct the past or right or wrong because I was on a train of momentum moving forward at a velocity and force that I could never imagine. To some, this was a power, unimaginable by mankind. The type of force that could conquer universes. It wasn't my intent to destroy what I loved, and I never perceived them as my people. In all of this, I have been separated from any type of love and warmth. These creatures are as robots. They know nothing else. They were not wired to feel, to love, to have compassion. Only hate is on their minds and warfare. What are they? And who created them? They are the contrast of all of us. The balance and contrast of all that is dark within our hearts to the extreme of lifelessness. Though they are alive, they are dead. This is why the zombie culture has grown popular during your lifetime. You would never have believed it had someone predicted it when you were young. That would have been an absurd concept to you and other contemporaries of the time. Many of them live amongst you now. They are able to look and act as you do, but they are not incarnated humans as they appear to be. This is disturbing to people, although, to some degree, they feel and know this to be true on some level. I'm concerned to share this with people so they don't harm any angry human soul who could potentially be confused as one of the hidden Vincala. They are not living in simple life experiences with family and typical relationships. They are powerful, but would not hold a strong schedule of work or consistent nine to five operations. They cannot maintain their exper their, their, they cannot maintain their appearance for any length of time in the three D space. They are primarily fourth dimensional beings. And this is where you are now, in the fourth dimension. It appears you are accustomed to being here. You interacted with the Chedron, haven't you? I can see it in your eyes. I remembered seeing the angelic beings of pure white with solemn faces. Their hair was white and their eyes had a beautiful white glow to them. They seemed troubled and at risk of being destroyed. They were sacred and very ancient. 
I couldn't help but notice that their names sounded like children. The name Chedron. I could see the innocence and love they emanated and came from the divine and had always been with them. Their stoic appearance was halting and the complete opposite effect I felt when observing the Vinkala. Yes, I was in their presence. I believe it transformed me. I could hardly speak a word in their presence. They were lovely and deeply mystical. They must have called you forth. It is rare. I've never seen... I've never been in their presence, but have heard of them. I've seen others who have been in their presence and have carried their energy with them. Maybe it is how you're able to be in this place now. I don't see her. I can't see her. I can't see how I could do this on my own. Borkham stared for a moment and then turned to see the troops of quadrants were cut in half. His awareness of who he was became triggered by the presence of love. Some of them are gone. Where did they go? They seek to exist. You are helping me to remember, and I can change things back in time from here. Each time I make a change, less are here. I continue to, it continued to happen until the last group, the original crew that appeared so far back in time, seemed to remain. They were the chief and Kala, the integrated, that integrated into the universe. They were the masterminds that took over Andromeda and oppressed Andronicus. They were the Vinkala who pulled Sumer from the human timelines into the alternate experiences. It was this core group that humans refer to as the Draco. I watched it all unfold. I suppose since they had violated my experience on numerous occasions, it has only seemed fitting that I had a role in identifying them in the end. Why is it that this last group is not removed yet? They stand out and appear different from the rest now. I can see that they're larger and more fierce and intelligent. And what do we have to do in this change? To change this? I don't know. They're very ancient and I don't, the extent, I don't know the extent of their power. They still seem to listen to me. You must go now. I think they will able, be able to see you now as, he, as you can see them. We will reconvene at another time. I must now move with them into the future to resolve something I foresaw. Don't worry. It'll be fine. I'm not here to betray my people or your people. You have given me hope. The outcome doesn't have to be what they said it would be. Maybe they will allow you to visit me again. Borkman reached out and embraced Sumer as a weary man, thrilled to find life on a barren plane of existence. In the moment, all was reset, and energy in my room felt lighter. I realized that I was merely sent there to help him remember why he was there. I also felt that Rodin had sent me because any other male figure may have posed a threat. Though it was dangerous, the Vincala recognized Sumer's energy and realized that they could not do any permanent harm as they had tried many times in the past. It was an energetic prote protection that I had. Borkham just needed to remember his commitment to Source and the future of all species he had learned to love and embrace. He also learned that the Vincala were not able to feel love or devotion despite his many efforts. It was as if there had been some former programming that created this crucial disconnect and separated them from all creations with, within our sphere and without. Either way, without deeper analysis, I'm grateful to be away from that space right now. Next. Welcome back to the third dimension. Yes. Or is it? <laughs> so One can never tell. Wow. <laughs> Wow, so that, this is some kind of Jesus. This, uh, you know, this I could see the the avenging hordes lined up, you know, vast armies, all identical clone type soldiers. It's very much like the Star Wars, uh, you know, um, you know, the the Clone Wars, and then it also uh, comes to the Daleks of Doctor Who and uh, the way that love 
the 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 Tara, the Tardis, and Rose just would uh, make them not exist anymore, just by the the swipe of her mind, that sort of thing. Mm. But it was the more he he loved, the more space he had. Yeah, to fix things. He, that was lovely. he forgot. He was so in, in entrenched in their consciousness that he for, he even forgot what his mission was, and he was trapped by them because. It was as if he had a hold rank. He had to keep them there. And uh, w- this actually happened, I want to say over the weekend, where I had this vision. I could see it clearly. I was not allowed to write about it until today. And as I was writing about it, it was really funny. is because I saw myself standing there, and I was wondering who I was looking at. And he turned just like that, turned around behind him, because I was standing directly behind him, probably about um, 20 feet away from him, maybe less, maybe 15. And he just turned and looked at me, and I knew he said something, but I didn't know what he said. And just I could see for miles and miles and miles um, the ranks of these reptilian um, Vincala just lined up perfectly. And he had them, it was like hypnosis. He had them completely at his control telepathically. Didn't have to say a word. They were completely obeying him. Like there was a level of devotion, you know, the way a dog becomes devoted to someone um, who takes care of them. And it was sort of like that. And he actually refers to them as dogs. But they... Of course, animals are, are kind and, and benevolent and full of love, and these things were, were really separated from that. They were just thinking of war. And so it started off where he had only a handful of them, this, this core group, and that every time he moved into the future, more would appear until he got to a point where it was disabling. He could no longer leave for fear that something else would happen, and I'm not sure what he was worried what would happen, but without him being at the helm, um, he thought it was highly dangerous, so he became locked in this time period, which is, here again, if he was Quetzalcoatl, this would be the end of his calendar, right? Still within the time period of the end of his calendar. And so... And the reason being he could not go back and or add on to that calendar at that time because he's disabled. He's he's being held at that place. And then as we were communicating telepathically, like time, space, or something would happen and he would recognize things and then we'd look over and a large group of them would be gone. They'd just disappear. And then I was curious how that was happening. I thought he was doing it. And maybe he was, um, which I asked him about. And then he kind of hinted that he was able to remember what he was supposed to do or at least correct something in the past. And then, then it revealed something other in the future. And so I didn't really have this whole conversation with him. I just saw the visual of it. And then today I was able to get, you know, the, the, the conversation of what actually transpired there that somehow I could not, um, uh, consciously be aware of say it like that but it was it was quite a, a vision he also looked very strange he's just like this big he looked like cousin it i mean he, he had so much hair and it just covered his whole body and they were afraid of him um and i don't know why but his appearance i think was intimidating to them for some reason So, um, yeah, that's what happened with Borkham. The dark, hairy man. The dark, hairy cousin it. Yeah. But he's scary. <laughs> <laughs> it was really weird. I mean, because his hair was really full and big and probably down to about his knees. Was it kind of lank? Was it, like, not kempt? Was it, or was it, like, you know... It was wild. Hmm? It was wild and wavy and, and really very black. All right, so kind of rugged... Like a hound dog. Like caveman like, you mm. know? Mm. But I wasn't even sure he was a human at first. I was just standing there looking and saying, What is that in front of me? And then he turned and looked at me and I realized 
who it was. And I'm like, well, why are you standing here? It was like, it was, it was like the, the Hitler troops, you know? Very much like the Hitler troops, only they weren't human. Hmm. Same, same feeling, different story, yes. Same feeling, different story. Yeah. That's exactly right. And they were all in the fourth dimension. Yeah. And I, I was disoriented about where in time, space we were because we were in another dimension. And he claims that that existence was going on at the present time, right around now. So, you've saved the world yet again, Jessica. Oh, uh, I don't know if I saved the world. I think he did. <laughs> I was, I was just there to observe it. Well, I was there to observe when. Interesting segue number 23, right? Because, do you remember what I was saying about Spock? Yeah. Spock left part of his consciousness in the Doctor so that he could come back and mind meld with him and get it back later. Oh. So you're saying I was the Doctor and he was Spock in this Yeah, scenario? you you held a memory of him as he was. And when you ha when you speak to somebody, you project that memory of them onto them, and that's how you know that that's them because they're synchronous with it. The other piece that they brought up is that the Vincala had been going after me, you know, over the years, yes, pulling me out of the time. Those pesky reptilians. And they try to get rid of me apparently all this time, and they, you know, I still continue to exist. <laughs> so they um, they thought I was the right person. Plus, if a male showed up, that um, Borkum might have felt threatened by it. And it caused the troops to come out the, the, a male. But since I was a female there, much more docile, he knew that I wasn't there for warfare. Interesting. So you were, yeah. ni you were neither food nor threat. Right. And you gave him something that he has not experienced in a long time, which was this, this, you know, this uh, experience of being in a, in a warm and loving atmosphere, which is what you create around you in your field. Yeah. So that melted something in him. Beautiful. Yeah, he was becoming like them. Yeah, because the they were the expression of his inner frozen consciousness mm. traumatized frozen, frozen consciousness yeah and so as you, as you loved you know just by being just by accepting him for all his hairy itness just by being there that created some chink in his armor melted mm -hmm. it and and then the vincalas start disappearing now it's very interesting because this afternoon i listened to a program with uh, john lamb lash and i'm going to replay it just after this show um because it's a fantastic uh story of sophia and the archons and here's the thing that there were nine human groups and our human group is known as the Tenth. And when you spoke about this person called R10, R10 sounds like a release, doesn't it? You know, release nine, release ten, R10, R9, R10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's. Uh, I like, know. It sounds like a number, doesn't yeah, it? It's a, it's a, it's a product number. It's like the iPhone six, the six S. The R10. We're R10s, or with with the tenth version or something. I can't remember how many civilizations have, they've, they've tried and failed. And what they say is that it's all about power, and that humans destroy each other because they discovered that they've got all this power and they don't know what to do with it. Um, but so far, we're doing better in being able to focus our power. So we're saying. Well, that's what I would say. You're hundred percent right. A lot of it is about abuse of power. Yeah. And you know, like Andronicus having the power to go back to Neptune, but he's not supposed to go there. But it's abusing one of the abilities that he has. Didn't that bugger things up? 
Yeah. <laughs> Midas, you know, doing the same thing, you know, knowing that he had the power to come into the human experience. But what he did was fill them with a lot of this, you know, I mean, he just got into the whole pleasure thing. Here's, this, here's the thing. Just, here's the thing. The word that is just poking right out. Indulgence. Indulgence, yeah. And another one, which I was thinking about earlier on during the, during the just before the show. Um, interference. Mm-hmm. Interfere. Mm. You interfere because you got interfere. You know, you're trying to control something that is a natural process that will play out all by itself without you picking it up. <laughs> you know, without anybody poke, you know, a seed will grow if you stick it in the ground eventually. You give it, you know, you put enough water and other stuff and uh, don't drown it. Um, the seed will grow and you don't have to dig it up 10 minutes after 10 minutes to, to find out if it's growing or not. You know, there's a certain level of interference and there's a certain other level of interference. All right, the interference of, of me just being in the way of the portal for me to talk to Andronicus. Yeah. I mean, for me, that was interference. Yeah. The uh, interference of, of Borkum going through the timelines and altering things. And he should have just left things alone. People can't help but fiddle. You know, they say the devil makes work for idle hands. You know, people, if they don't have constructive things to do with their fingers, they start tearing things about, apart. You know, how many people do you know, like, they'll take a tissue paper and rip it into tiny little squares or other sort of weird little activities. Um, I don't know, by the way, I don't know anybody who does that, and I wouldn't know what kind of trauma. <laughs> I, I just kind of pulled one out of my head. Um <laughs> But, uh, you know, little weird n nervous habits that people do, you know. Um, and you can tell, you know, the, the same person visits and then, like, in the ashtray there's this <laughs> little pile of squares of, of tissue. Again, I don't know anybody who tears tissue into little squares. It's just a, a kind of random thought. Um, it wasn't me. I haven't been there. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I bet you've known people who do that sort of yes, thing. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've seen it. But it was more of when, when I was younger. People, as they get older, they're, they're more aware of, of little little nervous habits and things of that nature. Yeah. I think people are uh, um, scrutinizing each other a lot more as well. Yeah. So here's the, th the other thing, is that they told me to stay put, and they told you to move around. Mm hmm And I've done a very good job of staying put. And I have been a moving target. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> How? Every day I'm on the road somewhere. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, and it's, it's you know, it's helped, definitely. And I know that, you know, and I've slept in so many different places that it's hard for them to integrate it to my sleep. But there was, um, the other night I, w I was out and stayed elsewhere, and uh, there was something that fell off the wall that no one has an explanation for. <laughs> Ah, one of those. So, so I said, did anything happen here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did anything happen here tonight? Because I knew they told me, they said, you're not sleeping here tonight, you need to get out. Mm -hmm, <laughs> I said, all right. And when I came back, she goes, yeah, for some reason there was, uh, you know, something fell off the wall. We have no idea why, but, you know, we just put it back up. Some uh, paranormal activity. Mm. Something was angry that I wasn't there, and they couldn't bother me in my dreams. And I had a pleasant rest elsewhere. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. How long do you think? What do you What do you think their lead time is? How long did they take to catch up with you? Um, I don't know. I usually get like a heads up. You know, I mean, sometimes the, I don't know, and and. I get thrown off balance, and I'll have something really weird happen. Um, but typically, it's not anything that's very serious that's going to hurt me. But they do get into my field, and they do try to get it, you know, create create out some like you know strange things. 
So I have no idea what would actually happen if I stayed in one spot the whole time, but I, I'm, I'm assuming that at some point it will it will end. Mm. And I'm hoping this whole Borkum thing might make a difference because that was all fourth dimension space. And that tends to happen yeah. before um, the third dimension space. So things happen in the fourth dimension, and then, like a few days later, they'll sort of manifest in the physical. Or maybe right, weeks. and so. I have no idea what the outcome of this thing that happened with Borkum. If, you know, I think there are multiple things that are happening all around us. And so that that's a piece of it. A big piece. You know, the Vincala are, are definitely a force that no one really wants to deal with, but not necessarily... Um, uh, I don't think that that's the only problem. Just like, you know, people say, well, there's one devil. Well, I don't think so. I mean, it looks like, you know, we could probably name about five different characters that had influenced our world in a way that could be interpreted as a devil. Um, we even had Andronicus um, possibly being Osmodeus in the devil's armchair over in France. So here's Andronicus. Andronicus has a dark side too that we know about. And it's possible that, you know, he showed up and looked kind of scary. And they have this depicted, um, statue of him. And on the wing, it actually says Zeus. So, you know, that was another connection that we made. And to most people's interpretation, that's the devil. So, and then we look at Borkum, who is kind of an influence of all, a lot of the military forces that we've had to encounter. And he could be considered one as well. And, um, Midas, you know, bringing in all the temptations of life. And so who do you, who do you pinpoint? You can't really pinpoint one. I mean, it's, it's just there, there, there's a part of the human experience that maybe was curious and wanted to understand these things and so it's part of the whole experience and we're all learning out of it at the same time but and then there were the, the Chedron and the Chedron were these um, amazing um, but intimidating angelic beings that I saw and now, yeah, when you when you when you brought that up, the first thing I thought of was Lita Alexander in, Bal- Badre, in Babylon Five, uh, who has this encounter with the the angelic beings called uh, the Kosh or um, the Borlons, uh, and she takes some energy of theirs with her. It seems you carry energies. You mm. carry you carry uh, backups. I never watched Babylon Five. I should watch that. Yeah, it's a great series. Yeah, it's really weird beautiful. Parallels. No, I don't. Yeah, and yeah. I don't even. I'm not even listening to their stuff. And then afterwards, if I, I'll say, "Wow, that's kind of weird." Yeah. Well, then, like everything's got, everything's been programmed. All histories is in sci-fi, you know, and it's usually it's in, it's in Star Trek, Babylon Five. It was done all the way, and it's still doing it with uh, Fringe, and and I don't know what's coming out these days. Yeah. Um, well, it should be Andronicus. They need to put Andronicus out there. Yeah, well, we're going to have uh, Andronicus. We're going to have the Sands of Time. Um, that's going to be an interesting series. Um, Sean's going to make, make that into a TV series. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's all about, like, the, uh, the, 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 <laughs> the secret government that is above the, the different, you know, governments, the, the inner government. The number one, the number two, the number three. <laughs> the people who know themselves as le- as numbers, not even the letter people, but the number people. Wow. Because, yeah. <laughs> uh. you know, there are people who, who um, know themselves as letters, you know. There's, uh, I had this, uh, where did I hear that? I can't remember. They were, he was talking about, like, his involvement. Number people, it's a number ID association. Yeah, you know, like, um, what was it in um, The Men in Black? One of them was K, and one of them was M, weren't they? That's right, yep. Something like that. And, you know, that's that's the letter people, you see. Um, Mm -hmm. But the inner core, they're like number one, number two, and number three. 
and, uh-huh. and whatever. They're, they, they, so be, beyond the letter people, they're the number people, and they're the, run, the, the ones that really run the things. So the number of people do not the letter people. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the, it's the number of people make the decision, and the letter people do what the number of people tell them to do. <laughs> <laughs> like Austin Powers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's that's yeah, exactly. Number two. Yeah. <laughs> number two. Oh God. Yeah, and of course the the British poo jokes. It's, it's uh, you can't get away from that. <laughs> so meanwhile, talking about British people. We had another little interaction, and I'd love to share this with the people. Is that all right? Sure. Um, because, um, well, when, when was it? Is Monday night, Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday morning? I but um, I, I, but yeah, it's Monday afternoon. Anyway, look, <clears throat> we just heard that uh, Bowie had died or left his body, and. Um, I get a message from Jess. Uh, he's been saying things. <laughs> he wants to talk to you. <laughs> it's like, okay, here we go. Uh, and so, uh, so, you know, you, we, we connect together and you start talking and it's, y- you're speaking about a kind of meta understanding of the entire process of Bowie's life. Yes. Um, and it just like, wow, that totally made sense of everything. Um, so I'm wondering if you could, uh, re, reiterate that, uh, for the people, because it was just such a beautiful expression. And instead of mourning his life, you, it's a s- total and utter celebration of the life and times of Ziggy Stardust. Well, um, it was really strange. I was standing there talking to a couple of friends, and then I got a clear image of David Bowie. I mean, I could really see him from a mediumship uh, perspective. And I said, hello. And he started talking to me and was very friendly and was immediately wanting to give me and my friends some gifts of um, energetic gifts to help the planet. And uh, I thought, well, that was that was really nice. And then he said he wanted to speak to JP. And so then we had a message that came out of that. And then I had no idea what I was going to say. I just sort of just shared the information that was coming through. And and I thought it was really kind of cool that he came to me, and I felt sort of a kinship to him, more so than I ever had before. And uh, then uh, Rodan came through and told me that he was energetically, now of course biologically he was born on this planet and had had biological parents, but um, in a previous time he was, his original soul was the child of Rodan and Mirren, Mirren being the um, uh, energy that came from the Middle Earth um, and she was from High Brazil, and he created High Brazil for her. So um, he called it High Brass Isle, <laughs> because, like in other words, it was, it was like a, um, an underwater craft, you know, but looking like it's an island. That's why it would appear and disappear, um, or other dimensionally, so forth. And, uh, excuse, and me. I apologize. excuse me, Jess. Yes. Check out yeah. the, the uh, TV series called Stargate Atlantis for... A, uh, a view of Atlantis that regards it as, yes, a spaceship that can, um, live on the bottom of the ocean, can come to the surface and can then take mm-hmm. off. So there you go. That's high, high brass isle. It's probably very much like Stargate Atlantis. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I believe that. And I, and I don't want to like step on anyone's lore and, and stories and be, you know, appear disrespectful. I'm trying to be very respectful to it. But also, if there's some insight, you know, I mean, maybe someone will appreciate that I'm adding some insight to it. But um, David Bowie clearly um, was very, very gifted, um, coming from this beautiful star connection. And, and, of course, being a son of Rodan, he would have tremendous power, which he displayed. And also a remarkable beauty in his, in his own way that was striking and unique. Um, his booming voice was reminiscent of... Of um, Rodan and Rodan having this commanding voice, and when he sang, he sort of had that commanding way. 
where it could, the tone of it alone seemed to reach people, uh, large groups of people within concerts and, and having this intensity. And I remember years ago someone saying they were at one of David Bowie's concerts and just feeling like he was singing exclusively to them. And that's the type of experience that these people got. It was, it was more than ordinary. So he started to explain to me what the purpose of, of David Bowie being here. And by the way, he didn't call him David Bowie. He called him, um, a dagnet or a dag or something like that. And, um, then he said that he was wanting to be able to reach all of the incarnated inner earth beings that had incarnated as humans, which, uh, you know, a lot of star beings have come here and in- incarnated and, you know, that's where we get the indigos and, and the rainbow children and all the, the crystal children and all that stuff that, you know, people have tried to define it as. Um, they came out in phases. The, the, I guess the, the closer to the core, you know, in dimension, not, not literally, but in dimension, closer to the core of the earth, they, um, you know, have a certain consciousness and then there's different groups that go step out further, you know, and as you see, there's different species of elementals that we know about, whether it's the Tuatadainen or the the uh, smaller, like the flower fairies, or um, the the elven um, creatures, or the you know the gnomes, and all these other different ones that people have seen. And um, what he did was he um, was able to connect with different levels of consciousness through his music, and it came, his music came out in different types of expressions and phases throughout the time. And he wasn't really gleaning from other people. He was bringing in his own creativity of what he knew and the type of tone and the type of rhythm and everything that would relate distinctly to these groups. So you have these large groups of people that really, really loved his work and and, and uh, came to him. And so his many phases and many expressions were relating to the many different types of beings on the planet that he was here to reach. And so um, I thought that was absolutely beautiful and even even the the, the uh, black star uh, for those um, beings that were um, in the inner earth but closer to the surface and really taking in a lot of the negativity of some of the human experience and the anger of uh, you know just being on the roads and traveling and driving and and wars and all that other stuff and so they're exposed to some heavier things and so the last black star was to help them and maybe those were um, also, of course, ex- helping him to release some of the frustrations that he had of of being sick the way he was, and and um, it was time for him to leave the planet. But um, that's that's another topic I think for Rodan to talk about. You know what happened to him here, but his his intention and the expression that he had was brought in to um, really help and heal and help. All the, um, the, the unique expressions of all these beings, you know, maybe not feeling like they belong here. Maybe they felt like they were, you know, whether it was the androgynous feeling or some other expression of their uniqueness that he was able to, um, sympathize and, and, uh, have compassion for and help them to feel like they belong here. And, um, that's, that's a rare gift. I don't know too many people that were f- able to do that. In its entirety, and not only that, his style of music changing, changing with these tones and, and frequencies, um, were, were able to address so many different unique groups. Whereas you might have an artist that their whole focus is one group that they're connecting with. He related to many, many, many different ones. So that was a blessing and, and it was a true loss in many ways. So, um, the, that's something that I wanted to uh, share, and thank you, JP, for letting me say that. You know, I have to say that um, that that little conversation that we had has left me in a state of near bliss. I mean, it's really sort of very, very strange. It's a, a, a feeling of very calm, connected, um, purposeful energy. It's lovely, um, and you know. If you kind of look at the world the way Bowie looked at the world, if you can take that attitude, 
then nothing is impossible. So, with that, good night, Jessica. Good night, GP. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back next week. <laughs>